Oh, good morning. It's great to be here in China. It's so amazing walking through the corridor, seeing all the amazing products using RIS-5. I think back 10 years ago, when we went to Hot Chips wearing these t-shirts, just a small group of students and a couple of professors, and to see you in 10 years where RIS-5 is gone, it's just amazing. So thank you all for your hard work. Um, so I'm here today to talk as the chief architect at RIS-5 um, and tell you about the technical status and progress of RIS-5. So we call this the state of the union. What is the union? Well, that's all of you. So all the companies, the universities, individuals, all working together to make this amazing global open standard. So how are we doing? Well, the state of the union is strong. We're doing very well. So in the embedded space, RISC-V is very solidly established. If you look, there were many companies who had their own architecture in embedded space. Almost all of them have moved to RISC-V as the standard instruction set now. Some of the other bigger companies are leaving the embedded space because they see RISC-V is going to be taking over. So RISC-V is very solidly established in the embedded space. Now, the really exciting time is coming now with we are just on the verge of RISC-V application processes becoming widespread. I'll talk some more about how we've been uh, developing that at RISC-V International and the progress there in having RISC-V application processes everywhere. Now, you cannot give a talk today without mentioning AI. Now, RISC-V is already the standard base core that people use when building new AI accelerators. And I'll talk some more about what's happening at RISC-V International and AI. Before I get going, one complaint sometimes I get from RISC-V is, is fragmentation, it's too complicated. And the question is, is RISC-V, is it flexible or is it rigid? And the answer is it could be both by design. So as Callista mentioned, one of the great things about RISC-V is it's very modular. It's in pieces. You can combine and optimize and add your own features and be very flexible and optimize for your use case. RISC-V allows this. However, as we move into application processes and servers, we need a more stable and coherent and common basis for software to rely on. So RISC-V also allows that. We are developing very tightly controlled mandates telling people this is what you must have to be certified as a RISC-V server, for example. So the great thing about RISC-V, it can do both. It can be flexible for a custom application, but we can also have a very tightly controlled common standard that software can rely on on many different platforms from many different vendors. And so when you hear people talk about RISC-V fragmentation, these people are confusing one with the other because RISC-V can do both, and there hasn't been other architectures that can do this. So it's understandable people are confused. This is new, this is very powerful for RISC-V. So I want to talk about this move to application processes and supporting binary software ecosystems. These are environments like laptops, phones, um, servers, where a lot of the software has to be pre-compiled and distributed as binary. And in this space, the, the software ecosystem, they would want to run on as many different devices as possible, and so they try and find features that everybody has. So they want to run on the lowest common denominator. But, and also the hardware vendors supplying the hardware, they do not want to build a feature that nobody will use, right? And so the problem is, if we are to be competitive, we have to add more features over time. So how do we solve this puzzle? Software wants to only use things that everybody has. Hardware vendors don't want to add features that software won't use. But to be competitive, we have to have more features over time. And this is why we develop RISC-V profiles. So the whole membership can agree. The hardware vendors will say, we will all support all these features. Software can rely on them. And because software can rely on them, they will get used and improve the performance of everybody's RISC-V implementation. So this is an important uh, coming together of hardware and software to decide on how we're going to advance RISC-V and make it more capable over time. 
So the RISC-V profiles mandate many features that you must have to be a RISC-V application processor. So the primary one we focus on in profiles are the RVA application processor profiles. And this is intended to support software ecosystems like Android, Linux distributions, anywhere else where there's a lot of software distributed as binary. Um, and we're designing the profiles so over time they will be backwards compatible and so old software will run on new machines. Um, and we've already ratified some of the older profiles. RVA20 really represents the first standard we had back in 2019. Recently we did RVA22, but the really important one is the new one coming up, RVA23. Um, we are working on a, maybe a different name for this, but for now it's called RVA23. And the key new features here, vectors are mandatory, hypervisor is mandatory. So the software ecosystem can rely on those being present and build very capable uh, software stacks around uh, RVA23. Just to understand a profile, how we structure it, a profile has mandatory extensions. Callista mentioned there's dozens and dozens of new extensions every year. In the profiles, we catalog all the ones that you must have to be compatible with a profile. And so a vendor, hardware supplier must supply all those features and software can use them. But we also do need some options. Um, one example is what we call localized options. For example, different regions have different cryptography standards. And so we leave that as an option that you can include the appropriate cryptography for your region. We also have some options that are intended for the roadmap. We have new features you want to develop over time. So we include those as a development option now. So you don't have to have them, but it lets the ecosystem get going on building the hardware and software to support them because later they will become mandatory in some future version. There are some options that will always be optional because they only help some applications and they may be very costly. One example, for example, is a large matrix extension. It may be very powerful to run AI, but it may be very expensive and not every core needs to have the matrix extension. So that's an example of an expansion option where you have the base profile that runs most software. But if you, you can include this as an option to get greater throughput if that's valuable to your application. We also have some transitory options where we're not clear what's going to happen. Um, they're really a special case. But to, to recap, in the profile, we have many things you must have mandatory. There are a few options that give us this flexibility we need, but that's the basis of the profile. Uh, another big, over the last year or so, we've been realizing it's very important to tell the community about major versus minor releases. So a major release is something that has substantial new functionality that's mandatory. And so, for example, in RVA23, the new features are vectors and hypervisor, which are mandatory. That's a very large uh, increase in functionality, uh, complex features. That's, that justifies doing a new major release. Um, but we're also going to do minor releases where new features as we see, we're, we're adding new features all the time, but these will be added as options in between major releases. So maybe a few years before we do the next major release, but in between, we'll make everything available as an option in a minor release, is the idea. Now, the profile is only about instruction set, things that a compiler uh, can generate or assembler can generate. But as we move to standardizing more than just the instruction set, but also the entire platform, we need platform specifications. So in the last year or so, thanks a lot of great work from many folks, we've made a lot of progress on our standard server platforms. And these will be critical to getting RISC-V adopted as the standard in data centers and many other applications. Um, and that full spec is expected soon. And one thing to say is the profiles and uh, platform specifications, these are really input to the certification program that Callista mentioned, and there's a separate certification committee at RVIA now that's driving the programs that will certify hardware later to ensure it's compatible with this standard. 
Now, I've talked a lot about the application processor profile. It's very exciting. It's probably the most important one for RISC-V visibility and adoption. But we are also working on other profiles. Um, RVB23 is a reduced, simpler application processor. And this is designed for where there's more custom software build, where you're using Yocto or Open Embedded, em, open embedded to do a custom um, software stack for some device. Um, and we're ratifying this alongside RVA23. Um, there's been a new burst of interest in microcontrollers. So there is a draft RVM microcontroller profile. I encourage you to go take a look. Um, it's there in the GitHub. And um, I've also seen in the last six months a big interest, increase in interest in automotive MCU platform around RISC-V. So I encourage you to come to RVIA, um, provide your input as we work on these standards. So let us know um, what you would like to see here and contribute to those, the development of those. Now, the ISA specifications have been developed over time by many people and in many different ways. And it's been difficult, if you're new to RISC-V, to find everything. And so we've been working hard to try and bring all the specifications together in one place, in one format, um, so it's easier to navigate the specifications. Um, the first step has just been finding all the specifications and putting them in one place into one document. And so that work has been ongoing, uh, a lot of progress. Uh, you can go look at the current state of the progress here in the, the GitHub. Um, now our goal, we still have a lot of work to do, but our goal is to make this uh, all the specifications in one tree and have a lot of ways of rendering, producing other output from those specifications in human-readable, machine-readable ways to drive other tooling. So this will be the single source of truth for all the specifications, and we'll use this to generate all the other formats we need. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. We um, encourage contributions, and please help us uh, uh, push this along. This is very critical for RISC-V. And what we will be doing is at some frequency publishing these specifications officially out of this single repo um, as our standard specifications. For example, every minor release, we should be publishing the whole tree uh, so people can see the revised um, specification. As well as new features, there's actually a lot of work going on to clarify and simplify the explanations in the specification just to try and make it easier for newcomers to read what's in there and to improve the quality as a reference manual. All that work is ongoing. So let's talk about RISC-V and AI. So it's good to go back into the history of RISC-V. Um, what people might not be aware of is when we started RISC-V in 2010, our original interest was in building specialized processes. And that's why we designed RISC-V the way it is, with a standard space and extensible space. And this was before the current wave of AI interest. So in 2012, when AlexNet took off and deep neural nets took off, that was really the start of this wave of AI. But we had designed RISC-V for specialized computing before this current wave of AI. But a lot of the features we put in there were really good for AI. So for the vector extension, it was designed to support mixed precision operations from the very beginning. So mixing 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, different sizes uh, together. That was part of the design from the beginning, and that's very important for AI. Um, and as a result, RISC-V has been adopted in AI accelerators by many, many companies. Everyone from NVIDIA, who uses RISC-V in their GPUs, to Facebook. And you see many new startups using RISC-V. So RISC-V is embedded in many, many of the AI accelerators um, people are already using. And part of this is this flexibility we provided allows you to add specialized AI extensions. AI is moving fast. So the great thing about RISC-V, we designed it for specialized processes. And the model we've created with RISC-V International allows you to add your own special instructions in there. And this is why it's so popular as a base for AI. But as well as this flexibility, there's now a move to we need to standardize. So AI, there are certain key functions that we'd like to accelerate and standardize across the community. So what are we going to do about AI-specific extensions beyond the existing uh, vector extensions we have? So at RISC-V International, we have two groups working on different matrix extensions. Um, 
So one is called the Integrated Matrix Extension, IME. Um, and this one uses the existing vector registers to provide input and output. So this is appropriate for smaller systems that don't need a huge amount of compute, but do need some acceleration for AI. Um, then there's the attached matrix extension where you need a lot more compute, and this can give very, very high throughputs um, in the extension. Now, these groups are very active. There's a lot of discussion. Um, it's going to take a while to settle down because many people have many different ideas about how they want to do this. And so it's going to take some more discussion in the group to come up with a standard. There's many different ideas here, especially for AME. Right? So I think it's going to take a while, but this is important for us to get to a standard. Now, one thing I mentioned at the, those of you who were at the European summit, I brought this issue of, do we really want a standard ISA, or is it really just an API for the matrix operations? For matrix operations that benefit from this new kind of acceleration, there's only a few of them. Technically, there's only a few ways that, only a few kernels that benefit from this kind of two-dimensional acceleration, right? Uh, it's just the way the mathematics works out, there's only a few things that can help. But on the other hand, there's a great variety of ways of accelerating that. So if you imagine all the different kinds of RISC-V cores, some of them will not have vectors. Some will have vectors, but no matrix extension. Some will have only IME matrix. Some of them will have AME matrix. Some may have custom extensions. So I think what's important for us is as we're developing the software story for AI and RISC-V, we should be enabling um, the best implementation for that current design to be used when we're running AI on that core. Um, so we should be standardizing these matrix extensions, but we should not expect that a single binary is going to provide performance portability across all the different cores we have. Right, so there's going to be additional work needed in the software stack to, to make things work well. And so, in any way, we'll need some way of putting in different libraries um, when we compile these AI applications, because that's just inherent in the nature of this, this code base. So this is all work that we're ongoing in the, the, the different task groups at RVIA. As well as AI, security is also very important. And at RVIA, we have a long history of focusing on security. Um, so I just want to mention some of the new work that's going on in security. Um, so supervisor domains, SMMTT, um, this is designed to provide flexible support for confidential computing. It's the RISC-V equivalent of enclaves for x86 or realms for ARM. So this is supervisor domains for RISC-V. And this is coming very far along. There's a specification I encourage you to go look at and read and comment on. Um, we're working on different forms of memory tagging. There's a new group started there. There's also Cherry, which is a capability-based architecture for RISC-V. And so there's a, a work group starting up to standardize Cherry. There's a few um, commercial implementations in progress around Cherry. In addition, there's a lot of work on post-quantum cryptography and other cryptographic extensions uh, going on as well. So a lot of activity in the security space for RISC-V as well. OK, so just to summarize my last slide, RISC-V, it's already well established in embedded sockets. Um, and with the profile work, the platform work, and you know, the work that Google and folks have been doing on porting Android and Alibaba helping there, uh, we're getting to be a reliable partner for application processor sockets. But the key thing there is having this profile that all the vendors agree to and the software can rely on. And RVA23 is going to be this major release that I think is going to be um, very important for the whole RISC V ecosystem. Uh, we're working to improve the, the specifications, as I mentioned, to make them a, a single tree you can navigate easily. And there's a lot of work moving towards standard server platforms with features that we need, such as uh, reliability, serviceability, quality of service, security features. This is all the work that's going on the task groups right now. Now, for AI, RISC-V is already consist, considered a natural starting point for AI accelerators. And we just have to figure out how we're going to best intersect with the AI uh, standard software stacks. OK, that's all I had. Thank you.